Uh, contrary to what you may have heard on the news when all this was happening, uh, we didn't have months of notice that this was, was coming and, and not do anything to get ready for it. This is an actual graphic from the National Weather Service on Thursday, August the 25th. And I'm not going to read everything on here, but what it says in yellow basically is that it's already hit part of Florida. It's expected to restrengthen and could swing maybe hit the Panhandle of Florida, but they were talking Tampa. And if you know your geography, you know, Tampa is right by the river corner. Tampa's right by here. So we had to keep our eye. And when you live in New Orleans or anywhere along the Gulf Coast, this is an annual event. It happens every summer multiple times. So you sort of keep your eye on it, watch it, do some simple things, making sure you have groceries and supplies like that. But again, this is a tropical storm. This is on Thursday. Move to Friday. Friday was an interesting day. Friday, it was still a tropical storm, predicted to hit Tampa, Florida. And I was at a friend's house that evening. Uh, there's a group of us that get together once a month. And about 11 o'clock, one of the guys turned on the TV to just check on the storm again. You know, we were just being diligent and watching it. And at 11 o'clock on Friday night, change from Friday morning, all of a sudden, it's still a tropical storm, but it's probably going to come close to New Orleans. So, of course, the room got quiet. Hey, guys, take a look at this. The storm has changed track. So, 11 o'clock Friday night. And remember, we face this several times a year, usually. So it's something, it's a drill that we're relatively used to going through. Saturday morning, we wake up. Katrina's a Category 3 hurricane. From 11 o'clock Friday night to Saturday morning, it went from a tropical storm to a Category 3 hurricane. Okay, that's something we really have to sit up and take notes of here. So, Loyola enacted its readiness plan, which is not a disaster plan, it's just kind of a checklist of things that we want to do to make sure that we're as ready as we can be for an impending hurricane. So, my director of computer network services and I went into work and went through our checklist. Basically, simple things. Make sure workstations are turned off, make sure that lines are closed, make sure that we cover some equipment, uh, making sure the alarm system was absolutely set. Just simple things that you normally do. And Joe and I were standing in the, the computer room, getting ready to leave, and he looked at me and he said, you know, I wonder if we ought to ship our tapes out of town. Now that's something we don't normally do. Uh, we, we partner with a, an off-site tape, uh, tape storage company. He said, well, we can't hurt like we call them. So we called him and said, come pick up the tapes. We waited. Actually, I think they back. They had the tapes already there. We ship them out Friday night. Uh, asked them to ship them to another facility out of their out of state, one of their facilities. And I put that in yellow because that wasn't part of our plan, but it proved to be very, very critical. We'll talk about that a little bit in the future. Sunday, Katrina minus one. It's Katrina hit on on, uh, on Monday. 7 a.m. We had a Category 5 hurricane. Put that into perspective. Friday night, tropical storm predicted to hit Tampa. Sunday morning, Category 5 storm heading for. Not a lot of time to get ready. <coughs> the media began talking of the worst case scenarios. I'm sure most of you know New Orleans is below sea level. They call it the bowl. We're surrounded by levees. Uh, and we are below sea level. And the talk of the worst case scenario is if a storm comes by and it pushes water from the large lake that's right north of the city over the levees, or we have a levee failure. No one was anticipating a levee failure. The levees were well maintained, as we, so we thought and uh, should have been able to stand up to it. Basically, the city ordered an evacuation at that point. As you to put this into perspective, we evacuated 1.2 million people in one day. Now, what you saw in the news a lot were folks that didn't leave. A lot of them didn't leave deliberately because they've ridden out storms before. And again, you, you tend to get a little bit complacent with these things. 1.2 million people evacuated in one day. Can your city do that? We've done it before, we've practiced it. Something called contraflow. Every interstate coming into the city turns into all lanes going out of town. There are crossover lanes that are already there to allow you to cross from side to side. One thing you have to learn though is once you get in a lane, you're going wherever that lane goes because it, it, there's no getting off at that point. But 1.2 million people in one day. The normal five and a half hour drive to Houston took 12 to 20 hours. So even with contraflow, it's a, it's a huge task to get folks out of town. Uh, personally, it was an interesting experience because I left, uh, it was a 
few of us going to the same place. One group left about 30 minutes before I did to go to Houston. They got there in seven hours. I got there in 12. So it was the luck of the draw. I lost. Monday. Now at this point, this is the day Katrina hit. Uh, I personally was in Houston. I had one staff member in Baton Rouge, one in Ohio, one in Tampa. I mean, people just went wherever her family was uh, and, and got there as quickly as they could. Katrina hit just east of the city at about 6, 10 in the morning. We lost city power at 9, 10 in the morning. And all of our backup power failed about an hour later. So at this point, we're off the air. I have no way of communicating with anybody. My website's down, my email's down, everything's gone. Uh, we, we really don't know why, when it's just a power failure, we're hoping. But at 2 p.m. on Monday, we begin to hear reports from the city, and they start to confirm that there were major failures in the levy system, but they really couldn't tell us where they were, how bad they were, how extensive the flooding was. And that's a really difficult position to be in, and that's something else that, that I want to bring out today. You've got yourself and your staff in a terrible personal position, and you're going to be asking them to do extraordinary things for their job. And that's something you have to really balance. The other thing that happened to us was we couldn't contact each other. All of our cell phones failed, even if you were out of town. And it was a combination of a couple of things. Of course, all the towers were in New Orleans were gone or down or, or didn't have power. But the major cities where everybody went to, Houston or Jackson, different places were overloaded with cell phones. People trying to contact each other, and the carriers couldn't effectively reroute the area code. A lot of that has been, I think, rectified with the carriers, but basically, <laughs> phones didn't work. Text messaging sort of works. That became the, the new jewel of communication. You could usually get a text message through. But, again, we thought we were prepared. But our primary and secondary, our cell phone method of communication failed. We had no way to talk to each other. Tuesday, the day after the storm hit. We spent Tuesday listening to conflicting reports of what was going on. And it was it was crazy. You would hear, you know, one extreme to the other. This area was flooded, and the next report, well, no, that's not flooded, but this area is flooded. So you really weren't in a position to maintain <coughs> the damage that occurred back at our site. Contacting our staff was nearly impossible. We were all trying. Uh, we also had uh, lists of most common evacuation points for each staff member, so cousin Ed, that type of thing, and you would call. But people didn't go where they thought they were going to go, so even that was a little bit spotty. And we absolutely couldn't ascertain the condition of our campus. In our case, our building engineers and our campus police stayed. There was a, there was a contingent of folks that stayed on campus. We couldn't talk to them. So we had no idea what our condition was. So people do desperate things in desperate times, and, that, and I'm going to go through this really just to give you an idea of what mentally everybody's going through. You have no idea if your home flooded, you're not getting great reports. So the Weather Service started publishing very quickly on that day aerial shots of the city. And to find your area, you had a, a map of the city with a bunch of little squares down at the bottom. And you sort of approximated where you thought your property was in the square, and you clicked on that and about 200 photographs would come up. And then you'd have to go through each one of those and try to narrow it down in your neighborhood. Well, this is actually my neighborhood. And this is what we saw uh, this day after the storm on Wednesday. This is actually the lake back here. I don't live far from the lake. This is a large drainage canal right here going out on this big shot, going out, to the, uh, going out to the lake. But didn't tell me a whole lot. But everybody's doing this, trying to figure out what the condition of their, their job was, what the condition of their home was, you know, Mom's home, dad's home, grandma's home, the whole thing. You can zoom in. This stuff was pretty cool. You know, I live right around here, and I didn't see anything wrong. Uh, this is the Wednesday after the storm. But I will tell you that all these houses flooded. All these houses flooded. All these trees are down in the street. But again, you're just thirsty for information. So imagine, imagine mentally what you're going through. 